can have a seat. Would you just thank the worship team with me? What a beautiful, it's just beautiful. Do you all see the theme verse that's right above me on the stage? I, I, it's funny because neither Andrew nor I nor Brandon really talked about the themes that we wanted to mesh together. But what I'm seeing happen is the Holy Spirit is making this really the theme of the weekend. Read this out loud when the Hebrews 10, 23, for he who promised is faithful. Amen? So my name is Renee Schlepfer. How many of you have heard me here before at Mount Hermon? A few of you. I, I, you know, if you, if you haven't heard me before, I know the name is a little bit weird. I'm super jealous of names like Brandon Passion. I mean, come on. And Andrew McCourt, that's a name with character. And Renee Schlepfer is just, I know it's just weird, the first name, Renee. Somebody literally came up to me the last time I spoke here at Mount Hermon and said, I was surprised to see you because I thought we were having a woman speaker. I'm here, oh. I know in the States it's a girl's name. I, I'm, I'm Andrews, Irish. I'm Swiss. My parents were Swiss. I'm a Swiss citizen. That was my first language. And they, in Switzerland, Renee's a very masculine name. It's a manly name. A lot of, like, pro wrestlers in Switzerland are named Renee. That's not true, but I make that up to make me feel better. So no more jokes about my first name. I've heard them a hundred times. I'm a little bit sensitive about it, okay? It's not funny. My middle name is Jennifer. I don't like to talk about it. Um, and my last name is Schlepfer, S-C-H-L-E-E-P-F-E-R. It's not only unpronounceable, it's unspellable. It's just weird. And, and, and I'm very well aware that I didn't ask for it. And so I thought, I want a cool name like Brandon Passion. And so uh, my previous career before I went into the ministry was I was in broadcasting. I was a disc jockey, Top 40. And at a Top 40 radio station in Oregon, in Portland, Magic 107, uh, the program director talks to me and he says, listen, you can't go on the air with Renee Schleffer. you got to come up with an air name. So I thought, this is my big chance to come up with a name that's cool, a name that's easy to spell, easy to pronounce, and a name that's masculine, not that Renee isn't, and a name that nobody will ever make fun of again. So I was going to seminary at the time, and I overthought it, as all seminary students do, and made it into a word study. So I thought, my first name shall be Ben, because in Hebrew, Ben means what? Son of, very good, Dave, who is Jewish himself. That's why you popped up with that right away. The rest of these people are ignorant, but you got it, Dave, that's good. <laughs> So Ben means son of, and for the last name, I chose Stone, because as in the Rock of Ages or Christ, the cornerstone, and in Christ, I'm an adopted Ben, son of the Rock of Ages. So I thought, that's, the name is Christological. I am a Ben Stone. That is my identity in Christ. So I thought, even though I'm going to be on a secular radio station, people are going to hear the name, and they're going to uh, be led to Christ almost instantly. So I, I, that's, I, that's, and maybe, maybe I can actually change my name to Ben Stone, because no one will ever mock me again. So I thought this whole thing through. The radio station went for it. They'd had jingles, Ben Stone on Magic 107. Uh, I mean, it was like there was no going back. So my first night on the air, I kid you not, I'm so excited about this new name thing. And I get on to go, Magic 107 is KMJK Lake Oswego, Portland's new music leader. Coming in with the top 10 at 10, number 10, it's the police and every breath she takes. On uh, Magic 107, this is your Bhagwan, Ben Stone. So I turn off the microphone. All the request lines are lit up. First call I answer. Magic 107, how can I help you? Uh, and I hear this like junior high age guy with like the radio station playing in the background and a couple of other boys like laughing in the background. And he goes, uh, yeah, uh, is this Ben Stone? And I'm thinking, perhaps this is going to be a witnessing opportunity. He's going to ask me about my name. I go, yeah, man, it is. How can I help you? And he goes, uh, me and my friends just want to know, have you Ben Stoned lately? Ha, ha, ha. Not to mention the initials. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> Even when I tried, I came up with a mockable name. So God gave me the name Renee Schlepfer. I'm sticking with it. I'm so glad to be here this weekend. Didn't Andrew do a great job last night? Phenomenal. <laughs> As I mentioned, he's Irish. I'm Swiss. Uh, I want to show you if we can get the uh, screen up. This is actually... Uh, the town where I spent a lot of my childhood, it's St. Gallen, it's in eastern Switzerland, and it kind of looks like Hermandel, doesn't it? That is, that is where we live. And uh, in St. Gallen, there is an ancient library known as the Stiftsbibliothek, and uh, this is actually the oldest library in Europe. It was started 
in the 700s, not the 1700s, the 700s. And they have a lot of ancient manuscripts there, including the most ancient manuscripts of German. And what happened was Irish monks founded that city of St. Gollum. They came down, trained by uh, St. Patrick's disciples, actually came down to evangelize Europe during the Dark Ages in the 700s. And they met this disorganized tribe uh, a, a loose coalition of people who were speaking this language that wasn't written down. And so they decided this, this language that didn't have an alphabet, that it had no grammar. And, and they thought this, this culture is going to be lost uh, because it was just this, this barely surviving island in the sea of Latin influence and Latin-derived languages there in Europe. So they thought, we're, we're going to preserve this language, and we're going to actually teach these people the gospel in their own language. And so they're the ones that originally wrote down German. And in that library, there is the oldest German manuscript, and that is it. It is the Lord's Prayer. So what I'm saying is we have the Irish to blame for the Germans. That is my point here with this whole thing. Hey, I want to show you a picture of my family. There we are. We have three adult kids, and they all have uh, grandbabies. In fact, in this last year, we met, welcomed, welcomed into our family not one, not two, but three grandbabies. And here they all are. Our, our three kids all had COVID babies. Definitely three very bright spots. And uh, how many grandparents do we have here today? Isn't it wonderful to be a grandparent? We are just digging it. So bright spots in our family this last year, but there's been a lot of tough times too, right, in the last couple of years, and there continue to be. Somebody told me the other day, Renee, it feels like every day the news brings another reason to lose hope. Do you relate to that? Headline in the paper about the threat of all the new variants and so on that are out there and new viruses, the summer of hope ends in gloom. Isn't that good news? Political cartoon the other day, fire, flood, drought, storms, talking about political storms. Stat, a medical journal, quoted a mental health expert who said, at what point do we get to breathe, right? Don't you ever feel like that? Somebody called most of us the exhausted majority. And what's happening is so many people I know, Christians, are finding themselves losing hope and stressed and tired. I was speaking at another camp a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I was getting some ice cream down at their version of the fountain. And when I came up to it, I said, how's it been going this summer? She goes, well, I just had a lady come up to me and just lose it because we ran out of coffee ice cream. And I said, you're kidding me. And she said, no. She said, I, but I come here for your coffee ice cream, and I'm going to speak to your supervisor that there's no coffee ice cream. And this is why my whole week is ruined because there's no coffee ice cream. She said, I just didn't know what to say. And that was right after I'd preached a message on how to handle suffering. So apparently she didn't listen. But <laughs> let me ask you a question. Was that meltdown about the coffee ice cream? No. It was just about the accumulated stress of the last couple of years that's coming out in this sort of thing all the time now. And this is why we need to hear what the Bible has to say to us in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. It's one of the all-time classic chapters of the Bible. It was written to first century believers in Jesus who felt exactly like I've been describing. They were ready to throw in the towel. Why? Think of what it felt like to be a Christian in the first century. Jesus has this amazing message. If you believe in him, you can be forgiven of sins and have abundant life, and the kingdom of heaven is coming. You think, yes, I'm in. Yeah, here it comes. But by the time the book of Hebrews has been written, it's now a few decades later, and it is taking so long. And the world is getting worse. And in these little baby churches, the early idealism is giving way to discouragement. They're thinking, I'm believing, but it's not working. I'm doing all the right things, but everything is going wrong. And the author to the Hebrews writes Hebrews chapter 11 to encourage them. 
I wrote a book on Hebrews 11 last fall that I called Faith Forward. And uh, this weekend, because we're turbocharging a whole week of camp into just these three days, which I love. And by the way, you know why I think spiritual growth is turbocharged at camp? Have you ever noticed how many people come to major spiritual commitments? Marriages are healed. Amazing faith steps are made at camp. I think it's because here at conferences like this. This is the only time in contemporary American culture where we are living the last couple of verses of Acts chapter 2, where it says, all the believers were together, and they ate together, and they worshiped together, and they studied the apostles' teaching together, living almost kind of this communal life. We never experienced that anymore, but we're experiencing it here. And I think that environment really lends itself to, to, to spiritual growth and the activity of the, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're, we're living the book of Acts, right? But what, what I did here is this week at Mount Hermon, I won't be able to get to the whole chapter, of course, of Hebrews 11, but we're going to look at three sections of Hebrews chapter 11. A hundred percent of the proceeds of this book go back to the ministries of the congregation I serve, Twin Lakes Church. I don't see a dime. And that's why I'm free to kind of plug it uh, in my mind. This book has 40 daily readings that go through the entire chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verse by verse. It also has seven small group lessons with videos. We have it available over at the bookstore if you want to check it out. And does anybody want this right now? Anybody want a free copy? Here you go. And uh, she's lucky, the rest of you are unlucky, and you have got to go pay for it. But you're supporting our church over there in, uh, in the bookstore. Now, the first thing I want to do as we dive into this whole idea of how to live faith forward and not in despair when we're in a world of uncertainty is I want to establish the foundation to explain what I think the author to the Hebrews is doing. Check this out. Time Magazine reported that some scientists did an interesting experiment they had a hunch, and so they did a series of simple puppet shows. No words, just actions telling a story. And they did these in a, 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 in, a, in a way that they were able to show these puppet shows to children of different races, different ethnicities, different countries, all around the world. And what they found was even the littlest children got into the story. They anticipated the plot, how, like how one puppet would jump out to surprise the other puppet. And, and this is the bad guy, but the bad guy's going to get his comeuppance, right? Even the smallest children kind of were able to anticipate. Even the pre-verbal children, you could tell that the way they leaned forward and smiled, they were able to anticipate where the story was going. Then they showed the same puppet show all over the world to primates, to chimps, to gorillas, and they never got it ever. They were like, what is happening up here? We don't, where's, where, where's the food? Their conclusion, the scientists, not the chimpanzees, their conclusion is one of the things that makes us uniquely human is an ability that no other creature has. And yet it's an innate part of humanity, storytelling. Think of it, we are not only the only one of God's creatures that tells stories, but stories are actually how we make sense of the world. We are constantly taking events in our lives, and we have this built-in human drive to make sense of random events, and we put those events into narratives, into stories. I picture it kind of like this, and if you look at the screen, this will make more sense to you. Events are like separate dots on a piece of paper, and we put them into storylines that you could envision as lines that connect the dots and predict the outcome, at least in our mind, about where the storyline is going. Like we're watching this puppet show all the time. One dot might be a personal crisis, divorce or cancer or a job loss. Another dot might be a global crisis that's happening, like the war in Ukraine or COVID. One person tells a story that trends down. And, and all these crises, all these dots just confirm their storyline that their lives are going downhill, the world is crumbling, God's against me, and all these events prove that story. Another person fits those same exact events into a different storyline that trends up. These events are trials that God's going to use to strengthen me. God will use even this for good. I just know it. I want you to notice 
same exact events. Two totally different stories being told. Here's the point. You cannot choose the events of your life or of the world. Nobody can. But you can choose the story, and the story you choose changes your experience of the events. I mean, it changes the way you, you apprehend the events of your life emotionally and spiritually. Check this out. The psychologist Dan McAdams, I, this, this, I found this rivet. I've been thinking about this all year long. He found that people in despair tend to tell themselves what he calls contamination narratives. This is a concept I really want you to get. Say that out loud with me. Contamination narratives. That's where the good is always contaminated by the bad. And you probably have friends like this or you're like this. You tend to go, hey, you just got back from Hawaii. How was your vacation? Well, let me tell you about how our trip was ruined. The airlines are so messed up these days. We had to spend hours in the airport down in L.A. before we ever got home. Let me tell you about the great stock deal that I totally missed. Let me tell you, you know what? I got fired. On the other hand, people leading satisfied lives tend to tell what he calls redemption narratives. Say that. Say redemption narratives. Redemption narratives about the same exact sorts of events. Yep, I got fired, but it actually helped me discover my true calling. It was amazing. I saw God's hand. Yep, man, my flight back got delayed, but while waiting in that airport for six hours, I got into this amazing conversation about the Lord. Yep, I didn't invest all that money in that stock, but guess what? Turns out that enabled me to buy this home that was a deal I could never have anticipated. And the narrative you choose makes all the difference with how you experience those same exact events. Now, let me ask you a question. Look at those two. In the socials right now, on whatever your news feed is, uh, when you look at cable news, and some of you have it on 24-7, and let me ask you as a pastor, do you really think that's the best strategy for your Christian formation? But in all those different you know, inputs you're putting into your life, are you mostly hearing contamination narratives or redemption narratives? We're mostly hearing contamination narratives. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's all going bad, and our democracy is going to be destroyed, and the churches are all declining, right? What are you allowing into your head? What, do you, what story are you telling yourself? Well, in the Bible, God's telling a giant redemption narrative, right? In fact, think of this. I want you to visualize the Bible this way. The gospel story has a shape kind of like an inverted bell curve, right? Jesus came from glory, from heaven, became one of us, humbled himself, died on a cross, the lowest of the low, but then was raised to life and into glory. That is the beautiful shape of the gospel. Glory to death to life again. Cross to resurrection. Weakness to power. And if you call yourself a Christian, this is not something you believe happened once. This is the shape of just about every narrative in Scripture as you'll see this weekend. And this is now your story. This is the shape of your life, inexorably. No matter what happens to you, every day. And so many believers miss this, but you see it all through the Bible. Andrew, you know, just ran through a list last night of so many characters in Scripture, David and, and Abraham and Joseph, who experienced the same arc, the same narrative arc. Uh, before we get to Hebrews 11, I want you to look at some verses I've been obsessed with this summer. 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 8. We all, we all love this first verse, right? In fact, read this out loud with me. Look at the screen. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We love this verse. A lot of Christians know this verse. But you ever ask, how? Paul, how were you not in despair, not abandoned, not destroyed, even though Paul went through a mess in his life, right? Talk about life in the crock pot. Paul was there. So how did he not despair? Well, he tells us his secret, actually, in the next two verses, but very few Christians ever go there because they're so hard to understand. 
Do you dare to go there right now? Watch this. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that is life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Skip to verse 14. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. Do you see the arc there? Uh, do you, did you see what just happened? Always death, always life. Always death, always life. We will die, we will be raised. What's all this about? N.T. Wright, who taught New Testament at both Oxford and Cambridge, so decently smart guy, he talks about 2 Corinthians and these verses. Look at this. He says, Paul's theme throughout this letter is the strange royal comfort that comes from the suffering and death and new resurrection life of Jesus. He is determined to view all of his suffering, all the troubles of the world, through the lens of the gospel. The gospel, as Paul summarizes it, is about Jesus. He died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. It mattered vitally to Paul that these were real events which really took place, but it matters just as much that they become, watch this, the lens through which the whole world can be seen in proper focus, the grid on which all reality and experience can be plotted. This is our grid. This is our storyline that makes sense of the events in our lives, the shape of the gospel. This means in the Christian life, we can expect both death and resurrection. This is so important. Paul's saying our lives have both. In life, there are crosses. That is just reality. God isn't mad at you. God's not punishing you. God hasn't abandoned you. That is just life. Even Jesus' life had a cross. Yet there is also resurrection, new life, new blessings, redemption, resurrection, restoration, always, also always, also every day. That's the shape of the gospel. And when you plot your personal crises and all the world crises, too, onto this storyline, it changes everything. Because when you're in the bottom, you're in that crock pot, you know that the best is yet to come because you know there's redemption. Bethany Hamilton, famously a surfer who lost an arm, bit by a shark when surfing at age 13. That's, she could have told a contamination narrative about that, right? Look at this. She says, it was a terrible thing that happened to me, but so many good things have come out of it, it has turned into a beautiful thing. Question, contamination narrative or redemption narrative? Redemption narrative. Look at this. This is so beautiful. Tanya Luna is a psychologist. She's a researcher. She wrote a fascinating study in child psychology and psychiatry. It's a journal, professional journal. So here's the experiment that she talked about. She showed little kids images of frightening things like this dog snarling and measured their response. Of course, they got scared. Then she went back through the exact same images and added captions that explained the images in positive ways, like, this dog is defending a little girl. Guess what? None of the kids, when they saw the pictures with the captions, still had a fear response. The fear totally went away. As she puts it, it was like they were seeing completely different photos. Now, why did she do this research? Because her specialty is adults who survive PTSD. And she says, what, they, what those adults do is they put captions to those horrible photos that add something different. She says, they don't deny the traumatic event, but they add a personal narration that redeems the picture. I grew, I learned, I deepened, I became a better person. Hurt does not have to be the end of your story. This is what the author to the Hebrews is trying to tell 
the readers. And he just lists off one story after another from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. In Hebrews 11, he talks about Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Joshua and Daniel and Jesus and more to show the shape of the gospel's redemptive narrative. All of them left their comfort zones and had death and hardship in their stories. You know, they got stuck in the crockpot. Then they had confidence in that redemptive arc, even though they couldn't see it yet. They kept moving faith forward. So each time I teach this weekend, we're going to see that arc in these stories. And, we're, and I'm going to invite you to put your own story in that same narrative. That's where we find hope as Christians. And so for the rest of our time together, let's just plunge into one of those stories in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's talk about Abraham and Sarah's redemptive narrative. As Andrew so beautiful put it uh, last night, God asks a childless man named Abram to look up at the stars, and he says, your descendants will outnumber them. God gives him this great vision, but before that happened, Abram had to take a step down into the unknown, a step of faith. God tells him, go from your country, look at everything God's asking and believe, your country, your people, your father's household, it's a lot to leave. To the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And Abram and his wife Sarah start a journey summarized in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 17, where four times it says, by faith Abraham. Abraham was the new name that God gave him, which means father of many nations. And I want to show you how these are the exact same steps we all have to take in our storyline, our narrative. Number one, by faith they stepped out. By faith they took the first step. Hebrews 11 verse 8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Let me tell you about the place that Abraham was being asked to leave. Look at the screen. It was a place called Sumer, where Iran and Iraq are today. Its capital city was a place called Ur. And archaeologists now know that Ur was the sister city of Um. Just kidding about that. I'm, that's uh, not, not true. Uh, he is being asked to go into the wilderness to the promised land, what we now know as Israel. Now, I want to give you some context so you can understand what God is really asking of Abraham here. Sumer and its capital city, Ur, were amazing. This massive ziggurat still survives from Ur from Abraham's day 4,000 years ago. Only then it had eight more levels. And Ur was the world's center of innovation at that time. Thomas Cahill writes, this period in Sumer saw an explosion of technological creativity on a scale that would not be matched until the 19th and 20th centuries of our era. Look at this list. It witnessed the invention of wheeled transport, sailing ships, metallurgy, fired pottery, written language, engraving, the mass production of bricks, the arch, the vault, the dome, the first legal system, the first lawyers, for which we will hold them responsible forever, the first breweries, might be a connection to the lawyers there, the 12-month calendar, the 24-hour, 60-minute division of time, geometry, and it all happened, as it were, within weeks of each other. And they weren't just brilliant, they were also ha having fun. So they were these technical geniuses, and they had a blast. They were Germans and French put together. Here's a massive mosaic they found with scenes of everyday life from Ur. This is from Abraham's day. Look at what these people are doing, a life of leisure, comfort. They're having fun, kicking back, listening to music, hanging out, right? They discovered a woman's tomb at Ur with this amazing golden headdress like something Lady Gaga would wear to a party, right? So it was a fun place. It was a smart place. It was a nice place. They also found a clay tablet from Abraham's time which describes the savages who lived just outside their city. Here's what the rest of the world was like. Buffeted by wind and rain. He knows not prayers. He eats uncooked meat has no house in his life, is not brought to burial when he dies. It's like describing a caveman, right? That's what everybody else is like. 
outside of Ur. So are you getting a picture of what Abram is being asked to do? Go from all this luxury and technology and comfort to hang out with these dangerous cavemen. Really helps you appreciate this verse, doesn't it? I know you're comfortable. But I want you to go where it's dangerous. And it says he didn't even know where he was going. And, of course, God says the same exact thing to you and me. Take a step. Take a risk. Get out of your comfort zone. Live by faith. How do you do that? Think first step, not whole journey. A lot of times we think, God, just show me everything that's going to happen and the problems there might be, and then I'll consider taking that step of faith. But that never happens. Let me show you kind of an embarrassing picture. Here I am nearly 29 years ago. This was taken the day I started at Twin Lakes Church. And I'm there with Pastor Roy Kraft, who was a yearly summer speaker here at Mount Hermon and had been pastor at Twin Lakes before me. He was the previous pastor for nearly 50 years. And so I'm stepping into those shoes. I was so intimidated, I didn't know whether to take the position. I overthought it. I tied myself in knots trying to see the future before I could take the first step. They offered me the position, but I didn't know what to do. And I was thinking about it for literally months. And you know what changed my mind? My wife. She said to me, well, Renee, first, our kids are so little that even if you're a miserable failure, they'll never remember, which was comforting. <laughs> it really was. And she said, I'll still love you. Just take the next step in faith. It's all right. And I'm so glad I did. But this is how life works. You never get all your questions answered before that first step of faith. <laughs> then it wouldn't be faith. So by faith, they stepped out. Second, by faith, they stayed on. When the ark trended down, Hebrews 11, 9, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, this phase of faith can be way harder than step one. When I finally arrived at Twin Lakes, the criticism mounted. I have a file folder full of critical letters, but this is from one of my favorites, actual letter. <laughs> Dear Pastor Schlepfer, it has been a long time since our church has had a competent shepherd sent by God to guide us. Now that you're here, it appears he wants us to continue to suffer for a season. <laughs> Yours in Christ, a sister. <laughs> uh. Now, since then, my mom has apologized. No, just kidding. <laughs> but this is how it always is. It's exciting to take the first steps, but it's tough to stay on with the ground under the tent is full of rocks, right? Maybe in your marriage or a ministry or, or some other area of your life, you had high expectations. Reality hits. How do you stay on? How did Abraham and Sarah do it? The Bible says he was looking forward in hope. In fact, skip to verse 13 if you're in Hebrews 11 with me. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance admitting they were foreigners and strangers on earth, but they knew the storyline. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one, and therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. He's saying even if all you can think of is heaven, sometimes that's all you know for sure about your future storyline. That's enough. There is reason for hope and not just dread, even when you are at the low ebb of the narrative arc, right? So by faith, Abraham stays on, and what happens? Well, things go from bad to really bad to impossible. Decades later, the promised baby's still not there. Abraham's 99, Sarah's 89. How do they handle it? Not too well. And that's number three, by faith they struggled 
through. I mean, they really struggled. Don't have some idealized view of Abraham and Sarah like every day they're having their quiet time. God, no matter how long it takes, we trust you for this promise. That is so wrong. They hated it. In fact, they even move out of the promised land for a while. Do you remember that part of the story? They leave. God calls them to the promised land, and they leave. And they straggle back, and Abraham even tells God one night, I'm giving up. I've had it. And that's when the moment Andrew told us about last night. Tenderly, he says, look at the stars. Remember my promise. And after that, Abraham was good? No. He made mistakes, super bad mistakes. Most famously, trying to have a son through his wife's maid, Hagar, which causes so much more conflict. But you know what? Amazingly, God is still so gracious to them and patient to them. And eventually, along comes baby Isaac. And after all your mistakes and your doubts and your skepticism, God's still tender with you. God still puts his hand around your shoulders and says, look at the stars. I have amazing plans for you. Don't give up because God never gives up on you. Even when you fall, even when you fail, even at that part of your arc, God is still writing, not a, even when you try to be writing a contamination story. God's still writing a redemption story in your life. And finally, Abraham and Sarah get to this point, Hebrews 11, 11, And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful. Not Abraham, not herself, but God. Faith means I trust in God's ability, not my ability. God's ability, not my ability. She considered him faithful. And then look at Hebrews eleven twelve. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And he as good as death. Talk about the low ebb of the narrative arc, right? How easy would it have been to give into the contamination narrative at that low ebb? <sighs> Man, left the glories of Ur. All that, the parties and that beautiful golden headdress and followed the vision my husband had for a new land. He said we'd be, he'd be the father of many nations. And we have nothing, nothing and you may feel like that, as good as dead. Well, God specializes in resurrections. That's the shape of the story. Your story is not over. Faith steps out. Faith stays on. Faith struggles through. And then let's wrap up with one final phase. By faith, they simply trust God. Their faith slowly over decades grows to the point where they simply trust God. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Now stop right there because there's probably more questions asked about this story than any other story in the whole Bible. But this is so important, so let me try to explain my view on this. In those days, child sacrifice was very common. The tribes all around Abraham practiced it. And so Abraham wouldn't have been surprised to hear that a God wants him to sacrifice a child. Human sacrifice was bizarrely, tragically common. But God stops him. That's the point of the story. This story is an object lesson by which God intends to stop all human sacrifice and says, look, I am now providing the sacrifices myself and he provides a lamb. God is showing that sacrifice is provided not by humans for God, but by God for humans. And the ultimate example of this, of course, is Jesus Christ on the cross, the sacrifice for your sins and for my sins. God says, no, Abraham, stop. I provide the sacrifice. You simply trust. Here's the thing. These four steps don't just happen once in our lives. As we go through the narrative arc of our life story, these four steps happen again and again and again. And the bottom line is take the next step for you. In some area, like Abraham and Sarah, you need to take the step of faith God is calling you to. What is that next step for you? Is it stepping out in some risky way? 
Is it just keep struggling, keep struggling? Is it, you know what, I've gotten to the point where I just simply rest and trust in God. And this doesn't just happen once. This happens again and again in different phases of our lives. Honestly, I think this is why God brought all of us together at Mount Hermon this weekend, through the music, through what Andrew's going to be sharing, through my talks, to encourage and challenge us not to give up, not to give in to cynicism or despair or aggression, not to tell some contamination narrative about history or about our own personal lives, which we're being fed all the time now. Contamination, contamination. But to say, yes, there's been contamination, there's sin. But what I'm living in is that redemptive story that God is writing inexorably, inevitably, for sure. I'm surfing that wave. That is how to live with faith forward. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are all people here, every single one of us, no exceptions, are people here who need to take the next step of faith in some area. And you brought us together to encourage us to do that this weekend. There may be some people here who need to take that first big step of faith, where they say, Jesus, I am taking a step into trusting you as Savior. I take my place in your story, the crucifixion and resurrection. And maybe there's some of us who just need to remember that's our story. There is revealed in us always the death of Christ so that the life of Christ can also always be revealed. Help us to think that story live that story, tell that story to ourselves and others every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.